So, good afternoon everyone. Today we are here for the talk organized by IITP MTT ACS student Bank chapter ISC. Uh, the talk is on simulation methods to improve the electromagnetic properties of electric vehicles. And uh, I will introduce the speaker. So, Professor Jan Henson, he received his BSc degree from Trent University, Canada, and then he went on to proceed uh, pursue a diploma in physics from Freiburg University in Germany, and later he obtained a PhD degree from ETH Jury in Switzerland. After completing his PhD degree, he was with the Information Systems Laboratory at Stanford University, USA, where he worked in digital communication theory, channel modeling, and web propagation. Later, he joined Robert Bosch in Germany, and eventually there he became the head of the simulation team in Bosch Automatic Electronics EMC department. And since 2022, uh, he has been the assistant professor in Institute of Electronics at Graz University of Technology, Austria. He also works as a part-time staff scientist at Silicon Austria Labs. And his primary research interests include the development of EMC simulation methods, electromagnetic modeling, and the application of machine learning techniques. So with that introduction, I will uh, invite, welcome Professor Hansen to please deliver the talk. Thank you very much for this introduction. Um, as you heard, the talk today will be about electric vehicles. So I brought a very nice picture of a future, futuristic electro, um, electric vehicle with me, which I bought at Bosch when I was at these times. I think I don't need to talk about why electric vehicles could be useful. Um, maybe just one question in the audience. Does anybody is here who owns one, a vehicle or a two-wheeler or something like this, anything electric? Not yet. I've seen some in the roads, which always makes me happy. I really like them because they are useful for decarbonization of transport. Now, industry needs to manufacture many of them, and uh, not just many just in, in terms of numbers, but many different types, like big ones and small ones, expensive ones, and cheap ones, and long-range ones, and short-range ones. So, the industry has to deliver all these different types of vehicles, has to develop all these different types of vehicles, and um, there are a number of safety issues that you have to consider safety mechanisms that you have to uh, that you have to obey there are mechanical ones and thermal thermal ones all sorts of um, safety issues and I'm focusing in my talk on a very particular one which is the qualification for electromagnetic compatibility that's called EMC and if you do not really know what it is then I hope after my talk you will have some understanding of, of what this means you see here, um, there's the inside of this vehicle and there are some voltage waveforms displayed. So it will have a lot to do with voltages and currents and electromagnetic fields. Before I continue, I'd like to um, thank you very much that I can be here. I feel very proud of having been a visiting professor at this very renowned institution for three months now. I can ensure you that the rank of IISC in India is much superior than the rank of Graz University of Technology is within Europe. So I'm very happy that I can be here and have the opportunity to, to deliver this talk. Um, I learned about all these entrance tests you have to pass in India. This is a difference between India and Europe. So I figured uh, to feel, uh, make you feel more comfortable and your time a little more valuable, let's have a little entrance test here. Um, basically, also to give you, me, give you some orientation about the audience I'm talking to. Everybody will pass, so no, no problem uh, with that. And my first question would be, who is an engineer in this audience? Engineer, electrical engineer? Ah, there, there are some, okay, so 50%. Who is not? Who is a chemist, a physicist, someone from biology? Not that many. Who has not raised his or her hands? Okay, so some were cheating. Um, no problem. So my feeling is I have an engineering audience here in front of me, so it's good because half of the talk will be more or less going into, into engineering topics. Okay, let's hop into the, 
the depth of this vehicle, what's inside, what does this vehicle, vehicle drive, what does it propel forward. Basically, there's a box inside here, so this is a box, um, this is what Bosch used to produce like three years ago, it's a box of that size, and this makes the vehicle move forward. The size, they keep decreasing, so if you buy a modern vehicle now, the box is like that size, so size is actually decreasing more and more because of advance in technology. And um, the core of this box is basically this here, six semiconductors, six transistors. They switch on and off in a certain pattern, and they, what they do is they convert the DC current that we he have here. This is the battery, so it delivers DC current and DC voltage. They convert it into a sino three sinusoidal current waveforms. And in order to demonstrate this, I brought a little simulation model. Now, since this is not my computer, Let's check if I can run it quickly. It's a very simple simulation model. Where is it? It's this here. So you see, this is this is very, very simple circuit simulation. So uh, basically, you know, no rocket science in here. You see those six uh, semiconductors. There's a battery and um, I can just run it. And then we see what happens. So make it a little nicer. We have the semiconductors here, and they switch on and off. And we will see that this switching on and off is actually the main problem we are concerned with as EMC engineers, because this is creating an emission spectrum which we need to avoid. Um, if there are real power electronics people in this audience, they will probably throw stones at me because this is a very simple model. So from a power electronics viewpoint, it's not that good. But from an EMC viewpoint, it's sufficiently well to demonstrate the cars. So if we look at the motor currents in this model, it's like this and like this. So you see this very nice sinusoidal currents here and your machine would rotate um, with a frequency more or less like this. And I said it's a bad model, so this year would not be a very smooth machine. It would probably be a little weakly if this is because of the model is not that good, but basically you see the concept. So you get DC current in here and you get those sinusoidal waveforms out that drive the machine. Important for the EMC engineer is not that. Important for the EMC engineer is something else, um, which is Basically, it's the voltages that are at the transistors, so these voltages here. Here you see a voltage waveform that's being switched on and switched off. I hope you can see it. So this goes on, it goes off, it goes on, it goes off, and it does so in a certain pattern. And this is actually what's causing the trouble. It's the switching semiconductors which yield to a very high rise and fall in voltages at these points. Now, why could this be a problem? First, it's a problem because there is lots of electronics around in this world. One electronic device that everybody has in his pocket is the cell phone, right? Cell phone operates with um, needs uh, electromagnetic waves in order to transport the messages. So here we see a different um, standards in mobile communications, 5G, LTE, whatever. They work in the gigahertz range. So we can imagine if this switching on and switching off of the semiconductors does produce some electromagnetic noise in this frequency range, it could be that you hop into your car and your cell phone reception is pretty bad or impossible. So something should be done about it. Here, this is um, mobile phones. There is also radio. Radio FM band is here at 100 megahertz. We have other radio bands at lower frequency. This is one problem. But wireless communication, it could work without. We have more electronic devices in the car, and I brought a very particular one here, which I like very much. This is a acceler acceleration sensor. And this acceleration sensor, everybody has it. It's, it's in cars, and it's, in, it's also in cell phones. And this has a very particular working mechanism, and I will try to, to show you a movie about how this works. Um, because to me it's very instructive. Let's see what happens. This is also a movie by Vehicles Bart. and modern consumer electronics I, are unthinkable without Excel. Can I switch on the 
noise, the, the loudspeaker, or is this going to produce Just problems? Acceleration sensors. Anyway, the sensors detect a vehicle impact as well as the smallest movements of a smartphone or wearables. The acceleration sensor consists of a signal processing chip and a micro mechanical comb like structure. These what we are having here, um, that's an acceleration sensor which is in any car and also in any vehicle. So if you turn your phone, you, usually you can see that, the, that the, the image in the phone can flip. And this is done by an acceleration sensor. The acceleration sensor feels that there is some acceleration to the phone, some movement, and reacts on that. Same in your vehicle, if um, the airbag, for instance, airbag is also controlled by such a sensor. So if there is some sudden turn of the vehicle, then the airbag may ignite. And this is a very sensitive structure. So you have these bond wires here, and there's a very um, tiny structure. This is about the size of four micrometers. So a very tiny structure, thinner like a hair. And when the, when the vehicle moves, then the distance between these changes, and there's a little current in use into these structures, the current flows over here and tells the sensor if something is going to happen. Now, if this structure here, these bond wires are disturbed by electromagnetic interference because there's a huge box of an electric drive system next to it, which having several hundred volts and up to 1000 ampere. If this box is located next to this box, then this guy probably is in trouble. This is the reason why we have to do something about reducing this interference and managing it such that a car can operate safely. If you want to much watch the movie, you can just use this QR code, use your cell phone, and you're going to see it. Okay, now I brought some signals, a measurement done um, at the university. This also is a little power device. So you see your two transistors, this does, this does not drive a car. But it's also a type of power electronics which does things which are related to what a full power uh, like high voltage inverter does. So there are these transistors switching on and switching off and you can measure the voltage waveform. So you see some regular pattern here. Um, there are some oscillations, it's a periodic signal. Now I said we need to consider the frequency domain spectrum of this signal because this is where certain services are offered, like mobile communications, whatever, the reception band of a little sensor communication. So we do the FFT of this and we end up here. This is um, the spectrum that we obtain. We see some regular, uh, regular pattern here because of the periodicity of the waveform. And then for instance, here we have this peak. And this peak is right in the FM radio band. And this peak would very likely cause our system to, this very little system, to interfere with our radio reception. So this is what the EMC engineer is worried about. Things get a little worse because now power electronics people come along. And power electronics people say, we want to have these boxes smaller and smaller. As I said, three years ago, the box was like this. Now the box is like this. This happens because we have new semiconductor technology. So everybody here, because you are engineers, I learned, everybody here may have heard of silicon carbide, gallium nitride, nitride transistors. Power electronic engineers really like them because you see here, there are several um, application cases. We look here at the motor drive. Um, if we use SIG devices or gun devices, then the volume of our system can be reduced by 46%. The power density can double or even triple using these devices. So they, they are very, very attractive from a power electronics point of view. Unfortunately, for an EMC engineer, they are pretty bad. Because how is this gain in performance achieved? It's achieved by a change in switching time. The switching time of the traditional devices, silicon devices, they are like 100 nanoseconds, and these go down almost by a factor of 10. So switching time is increased, is decreased significantly, which is good for power electronics, but it is bad for the emission of such a system. And why is this so? There's a very simple 
bigger, so you can compute if you have a periodic trapezoidal signal, you can approximately compute its, its spectrum. And the spectrum goes with some constant line here, and then it falls off with 10, 20 dB per decade, and then it falls off with 40 dB per decade. And the point where this transition from 20 to 40 dB, 40 dB starts, this is a function of the rise and fall time. And it turns out, if we multiply, or if we reduce rise and fall time by a factor of 10, then we end up from this continuous line to this dotted line, and above a certain frequency, we have 20 dB higher emissions, which is pretty bad from an EMC um, point of view. But this is what's going to happen. So all, all the power engineers start implementing new devices, SIG devices, and gun devices, and they are making the thereby they make the electromagnetic emission of the um, of vehicles actually worse than they used to be before. So this is sort of a summary um, of what I've said so far. This is a very, very favorite vehicle of my lecture. Students like it. Um, and there are all these devices inside the vehicle. We have the inverter, we have battery, we have the machine. And this structure actually by conducted noise and by radiated noise is interfering with other parts in the car. And um, we have to work on this in order to ensure that this does not ca cause any trouble. You can do this experimentally. Every company does it, but you can also do it by simulation, which is very attractive because you do not need any hardware. Hardware is expensive. You need lab equipment. You need not need lots of space. If you do it by simulation, you just need a computer, and you do not need this expensive hardware. And a prototype of an inverter can cost like fifty thousand euro. This would be, if you add two zeros, five million rupees. That's just one. Usually, it gets destroyed using testing. So it really makes sense to put these things into a computer because you can't destroy anything, and you save lots of money. And this is why companies like to do it. I've brought two very simple examples of um, how such a simulation looks like in order to give you a feeling what engineers do. Um, in principle, there are quite a few possibilities to simulate such a vehicle. There are simple ones, there are advanced ones, there are really complicated ones. Basically, what you could distinguish is you can do a network-like description. So basically, you know the elements. There are resistances, inductances, uh, capacitances in here. Or you don't know these elements. Um, you basically have a geometry. Then you need a full 3D um, simulation, which basically is solving Maxwell's equations. So you have circuit equations, you have network circuit equations, and you have Maxwell's equations. Secondly, you can do your simulations either in frequency domain. This usually is very fast, very convenient. Um, sometimes you have to do it in time domain to really see the switching on and switching off of your transistors. Um, this is better if you can do. Sometimes you cannot, then you have to do that. The choice of the um, simulation that you choose is a function of the frequency that you are looking at. Here there are uh, several um, frequency regions are displayed here, and there are certain simulators that you can use that you are supposed to use if you want to have an answer to all these questions. At very low frequencies, this is more or less functional simulation. So this is what power electronics people do. They use tools like Plex, where you can really monitor what the hardware does. So this is function. This is not electromagnetics. There is an intermediate frequency range where you use the can very successfully apply the network simulation. Um, so this basically is a function, functional simulation and something added on top, which we call parasitic elements. And if you are in the frequency above, like th about 30 megahertz, then you need a full 3D simulation, like Maxwell simulation um, of your devices. You need lots of information about your device, and simulation time becomes long, and model building becomes quite complex. Um, I want to start with this type one circuit simulation. Um, so we are here now. Frequency range is between one, one megahertz, around one megahertz up to 30 megahertz, some hundred kilohertz, something like this. Um, I brought a simple example here. Again, this example from the lab. So we see here this is a very simple. Um, this is a um, power converter with these two gun semiconductors in here. There is some control for these semiconductors that they can switch on and switch off. 
And usually um, you put it in, in the AMC's design, you put such a device on top of a metallic table. This metallic table has some re re resemblance to the chassis of a car. This is why it needs to be metallic. And then um, you, you need to supply for these for this device. You need a power supply, and you monitor your um, you monitor the voltage of this device at two um, boxes, which are called Leeson. And there you can monitor the voltage, and you display it on a spectrum analyzer. Basically, you, you directly look at the spectrum. Now, how would such a simulation look like? First thing you could do is you would um, go to your hardware designer, you ask your hardware designer, okay, give me your circuit schematic. Give me a circuit schematic of your device. So it looks like this. This is um, what the entire half bridge is about. We have these two gun transistors, and then we have a little load attached here. So this is a very, sort of very simple model of a machine. This just switches on and switches off, and we have DC link capacitors, power electronics people will know about it, and we have a supply. This is the functional model. The point is, um, in this model, there is no EMC yet contained. There is no point where we can measure. We need to um, put our EMC measurement set up into this model a little more precisely. This happens in the next step. This resembles a little more what um, the experimental setup actually looks like that I showed to you. So again, we have here our two, um, two gun transistors, we have the DC link capacitors, we have our supply. But as I said, we need these measurement points, which is called Leeson, which is installed here. So there are some capacitances and a measurement point here. This is on the plus side and on the minus minus side, we need the same. And everything is located on a metallic table. Now we could say, okay, this is nice. This is a good representation of our of our um, reality. We have the two measurement points here. We can run the simulation, um, look at the spectrum of the simulation at these two measurement points, and we are happy. We know what the EMC of this device does. Um, in the next step, we do so, and we compare two measurements. So the green curve is actually this EMC spectrum of this device measured at one of these two boxes. And we see it goes down like this, and um, then it's flat. Unfortunately, our simulation looks like that. So at the first few harmonics, it's really, really nicely resembles what we see. But at higher harmonics, actually, it's complete nonsense. So apparently, something we have forgotten. And uh, this gives us a hint that EMC simulation is something really subtle. So if you just put like hardware in a simulation like it is and don't think about what happens, your models will be all wrong. What's the reason for this big mistake in our simulation model? Well, you, re you may remember your very fundamental um, field lectures, electromagnetic lectures, and they tell you that uh, there is a relation like this, Q equals C times U, where C is a capacitance, U is a voltage, and Q is a charge. This is electrostatics. This is not even electrodynamics. And U is the integral of the electromagnetic field. So we have those two charges here, those two spheres here, and they are charged. And um, as a matter of what you have, if you have a charge and you have a capacitance, then you can compute the voltage between the spheres. Or you have the voltage and you have the capacitance, then you see these charges of the spheres. This is static. Now, in our system, we have moving charges. There is a, um, as I said, there's voltages are switched on and switched off. So basically, we take the derivative of this equation and we see we have these two circuits here. So we have a AC voltage source, which changes the amount of charges on this sphere. And on this victim circuit, um, there are also charges in use. And since this is time varying, we have moving charges, so we have a current. This current we can measure. And this is a very, very typical effect that we do have capacitances in our system. We do have changing voltages at some point, and somewhere else a current is induced. Now let's have a look at our measurement setup where this could be. Where could we find such a structure? And if we have a look at it, we see, well, actually, there are quite a few possibilities to have these capacitances. This is our board, and there are some electronics on the board. There are wires. 
when the board has a ground, actually, um, there, there's this huge metal table. The metal table is responsible for lots of mass, actually, in our EMC. But we cannot just leave it away, because leaving it away would mean we have a car without a chassis, and a car without a chassis wouldn't drive. So we have to have it in our simulation, and it's causing all these capacitances from the, from the ground of the board to the table, from traces of the board to the table, and of course there are more capacitances um, also inside the structure. Apparently, we should take them into account. And fortunately, at low frequencies, as I said, circuit simulation is like 1 megahertz, 10 megahertz. Wavelength is huge. So hopefully, we get along with only very few of them. Because if wavelength is like this, I hopefully don't need to put 30 capacitances into my model to cover this effect of something being charged. The solution in this case looks like this. I add a single capacitance in here, which I call common mode capacitance. The common mode in the end is the mode that flows here back around the table. And why do I add it here? I add it here because, as I said, the main half in voltage from zero to maximum voltage happens here at those switches. So the DUDT of my circuit is highest in this point. And as I said, this induced current is a function of, uh, of u dot, u dt. I just put it here. This capacitance, I need to get somewhere. Usually, I can measure it. Of course, it's the, uh, the capacitance of the metal structures on top of the table to the table. And that I can measure, or alternatively, I can simulate it. So I refine my simulation model by adding just this single capacitance. And we can see what's going to happen. Now we have three curves. One curve is the measurement, that's still the green one. One curve is the blue one, which is this previous model without the capacitance. And now we have this model with the capacitance. And what it does exactly at these one, two megahertz where it requires this effect of the capacitance comes in and nicely describes the measurement. So we can see that in our very simple, very tiny inverter, it's like this, or converter, after one megahertz, a purely capacitive geometrical effect determines the opla, determines the, um, the spectrum of our system. And if we want to simulate it, we need to take these other subtle effects into account. And if we don't know them, then either we need a good guess, or we need a field simulator, or we need lots of experience. And experience also is an important part in EMC. What would happen next? Next would happen that some other guy comes along and says, yeah, now we have all these limit lines, which are given by standardizing bodies, claiming that if the MC, if the spectrum of a device is above this green level, it's like really bad. If it's above the blue level, it's still not good. Um, basically, companies choose on which limit lines they accept. And obviously, all companies choose the lowest one. Um, because they want to be their devices as safe, safe as possible, at least the companies I work with, they do this. So here would be lots of work for the EMC engineer by adding, for instance, adding a filter, adding, adding a housing, doing some usually known measures in order to reduce this spectrum below those blue lines. This is the simple part of the simulation, just circuit. And you see at le very low frequencies, if we have a good idea of what happens, this works pretty well. But in high frequencies, it doesn't work anymore because you can imagine wavelengths get smaller and smaller and describing all these effects by discrete elements, that doesn't work anymore. Um, it gets, you can try, it gets harder and harder the higher the frequency gets. And fortunately, there are very well-developed um, 3D simulators, Maxwell simulators around, which you can use. and. Um, if you have the time to drag along all the simulation, all the all the information about your car, all these geometry detail details, these components, then you can build such a model. It's pretty challenging, actually, in EMC. So the, the methods we use, electromagnetics, that's like antenna design. But in antenna design, you have the advantage. You have you are sort of in the optimum, so you want to, a device to radiate as well as possible, and you de design it to be very strong in what it does. This is nice to do. EMC, unfortunately, is the opposite. You are very close to the noise, and you have to reduce this noise floor even further. 
as we saw, it's these single capacitances that you need to catch if you don't do your model is wrong. And in power electronics, you see it can be a system like this. This is a measurement setup from a lab. So we have two meters of wire here. It's actually shielded wires, three of them that connect them. Um, now this is two of them that connect the, the high voltage battery to the inverter. This is the inverter. We have three wires that go to the machine. So this in total is like three meters. On the other hand, we have here details which are like micrometers. And in simulation, we have to cover this entire range from micrometers to meters, which is about a factor of one million. In time also, we have this rotating machine, which is like millisecond or second, um, but the switching event of the semiconductors, this is nanoseconds. So again, it's a factor of one million in time that we have to cover in such a simulation. So it's, I would say it's, it's not that trivial um, to do this correctly. It needs some knowledge about what you want to do. Um, I want, do not like to go too much into the details of such a model. Um, this is just an example. So this is how it looks like. You basically, this is this um, converter that I showed in the, in the measurement. So this is the 3D model of it. Basically, you need to get all the geometry information, the PCB layout, the assembly elements, um, the wires, the table below it. And you can plug it all into, into uh, such a Simulator and these things meanwhile they have advanced a lot over the over, la, over the last 10, 15 years. You can run such a simulation and um, without guessing any parasitics, because this is what the machine does for you, um, you also get a good result. Let's see how this looks like. Yes. So this is such a simulation and a measurement. Um, here we see now it goes up to 300 megahertz. Previous simulation stopped here at 30 megahertz. Where you got this flat region here, and then many things happen. Resonances appear because your wavelength gets into the length of the structure. You have more interactions, more capacitances, more inductances interacting with each other. So this is why you see then a structure like this. And you can imagine this is really hard if you model it manually um, in, in a circuit simulator. Um, yeah, so blue is the measurement, the envelope, yeah, black, black here is the simulation. So that works quite fine. Um, but as I said, you need to drag along all this information. Here is a short summary for those who are interested in the details. What would you actually need to consider? So we have this very quick model that works under, under 30 megahertz. You will see you do not need a lot. You can do lots, a lot with guessing. And these models are very fast and very powerful because speed is something you need in your design process. Here on the right hand side, there is much more to do, much more sub modeling component models are needed in order to describe this correctly. This is sort of state in industry. So what industry can do is they have all these tools and they know when to uh, when to use which, and they are able to produce these results in parallel to their design, so that they do not need these big boxes to buy these big big boxes for uh, five million rupees. But what else can you do? Now some people come along and say it's nice to do this one time or two times or ten times with these simulation models. Why not doing it many, many, many times and see what's going to happen? And in that region, we come into that, what I, uh, I do as my research, also with the fellows here from, from IISC. Um, we try machine learning. What's the strategy in machine learning? You may have seen it. So basically, you draw some initial samples. You run your model on these samples. Samples would now be different converter structures, like a small one and a slightly bigger one and a green one and a blue one. So you run um, on a couple of samples, you run your model. This would be your um, simulation model. What you do then is after you have done this about 50 times, um, you construct a so-called surrogate. This is a very fast model that once it's trained, it can predict the outcome of your simulation immediately. Right now we have an average of like 50 milliseconds. So instead of a circuit simulation that takes 30 seconds or a 3D simulation that takes half an hour or three hours, we have an answer of our system within 50 milliseconds. This is very fast. You can estimate that doing so you can run 1 million simulations per day. So by doing this machine learning training, um, running this circuit um, until you have one of the surrogate models, um, 
Yeah, you, you can get one of these surrogate models, models with a sufficient accuracy. It's a trained machine learning model of not one device, but of a bunch of devices. So what's going to happen? My view is that it's going to change the simulation landscape significantly. Previous, I was talking about that solution. So we have this one device and there's a prediction of what this one, de one device does. And if you want to change this device, then we change this device, run another simulation and so on. This is how it's done today. What do we do here? We have, now we have a machine learning model. That's actually a bunch of models. It's an infinite amount of models within a certain range. The range is the one that I have trained. And having trained these, now I have this big sphere of where all solutions are in there, already pre-computed. Now if someone comes along and says, okay, I want to have this big inverter in yellow, uh, I need it for this vehicle, then we just look into the sphere and say, okay, take that, take that one. Next one comes along and says, yeah, I want to have this blue inverter for this blue two-wheeler. Um, I have this and that pro uh, requirements on, uh, on my design. We just look into the sphere and say, take that one. So everything is nicely pre-computed already. We just need to look into the sphere and pick according to the requirements that we have a good solution. And my view is that this is going to change simulation landscape significantly. We are in the middle of working on this. So there is no, there is a sphere already, but there is not a good way of picking points from these spheres because we're having all these multi dimensions. Right now we work in 14 dimensions several of them are conflicting to, with each other, so it's not just saying it's that one, it could be several ones, and we are working on finding them. This is how our plots look like, so we have several dimensions here, we can display always three of them, three out of 14. So we have several of these plots, like one plot, second plot, third plot, until we, until we have all these 14 dimensions visualized. And we see here those, there are those Pareto fronts where we can choose optimal designs which just fulfill our EMC limits, so they are not that costly and they have good properties, for instance, small size or easy design or little cooling. This is what we are looking for. And as I said, right now we are investigating these figures. I think there's the next one. Yeah, this is another one coming saying where well, we look at all these dimensions and we try to find most optimal points in all the dimensions which are important for us. And since there are so many, we are a little troubled with sorting these dimensions and figuring out, okay, which one is the one we, might, we like most. But I'm pretty confident that having done this, um, we find really good solutions and the industry will like it. Okay, and this is pretty much it. So I have a very rough list I assembled of, which, of what you should have taken out of this lecture. Um, I hope now you know why this EMC is important for electric vehicles, because if not, bad things could happen. I hope you've understood what EMC is about. So there are these spectrums, there are these emissions, there are these fast changes in voltages.